Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this program, Graphic Novel Book Talk for Adults. I'm Laurel Westendorf. I'm part of the Community Relations team here at the Deschutes Public Library. Every month we explore a theme in our programming, and this month's theme is comics. You can find more free library programming on our event calendar at deschuteslibrary.org forward slash calendar, or you can find recordings of programs like this one on our YouTube channel. Our presenter is Lee Button, Collection Development Librarian here at the Deschutes Public Library. Before coming to DPL, Lee held a variety of library positions, most recently at the University of Washington's Tadeuchi East Asia Library. When not at work, Lee enjoys karaoke, reality TV, and anything involving Batman. So I think we have the perfect candidate to show us the world of graphic novels. Thank you so much, Lee. Ashley, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. Just give me a second to get that up. All right. So as Laurel said, this is Graphic Novels for Adults. My name is Lee, and I am so excited that you all were able to join me today. I wanted to start by giving you a brief overview of what I'm planning to talk about today. First, I'm going to start with a quick icebreaker activity so that you all can get a better sense of who I am, and I can get a better sense of who you all are. Then I'll be attempting to define what a graphic novel is and providing a couple of extremely compelling reasons why everybody should be reading them. I then wanted to finish up by recommending a few titles that are a good place to start if you're new to the world of graphic novels, as well as a couple of my recent uh, favorites. At the end, we'll hopefully have time for any questions um, that you all might have. Um, hopefully that all sounds good. <laughs> uh, let's get started. So like I said, a quick icebreaker activity. I'm gonna be asking three questions um, and then I will be providing you all my answers. I would love it if you could provide those answers as well, answer those questions as well. Um, you, know, you all don't have the ability, unfortunately, to uh, you know, share them verbally, but if you wanna drop them in the chat, that would be awesome. I mean, I can take a look at those. Um, you don't have to answer all three questions. You can just pick one or you can answer as many as you feel like. Um, uh, hopefully that all sounds good. Um, any questions once we get started, uh, let me know. This... So three questions, like I said. The first question, what is your favorite book? Second question, what is your favorite movie? And third question, what is your favorite TV show? Like I said, I will be sharing my answers with all of you in just a moment. If while I'm doing that, if any of you wants to drop your, drop your answers to one or more of these questions in the chat, that would be awesome. Don't stress about it too much if you can't pick just one favorite. You can also share a book, movie, or TV show that you read or watched recently and particularly enjoyed. So, favorite book, movie, TV show. My answers to these questions are as follows. My favorite book is Dahlgren, written by Samuel R. Delaney. My favorite TV show is America's Next Top Model. And my favorite movie is Carrie starring Sissy Spacek. I realize I went out of order with those. I hope that didn't throw anybody. Does anybody else want to show their share their favorite book, movie, or TV show? I'm seeing that Marilyn says favorite TV show, Seinfeld. Awesome. Love that. Um, Laurel is saying favorite book, Five Sacred Things. Favorite movie, Jurassic Park. Favorite TV show, Parks and Rec. Maybe a, a park theme going on there. Anybody else want to share? I'm seeing April, Schitt's Creek is favorite TV show. Favorite book, Blankets, and movie, Zoolander. Love mm -hmm. Zoolander. And movie, uh, Marilyn's favorite movie, Annie Hall. Deborah's same favorite book, Gone with the Wind. Awesome. So we're getting a pretty wide uh, <laughs> range of interests represented, which is really cool. And then Marilyn's favorite book is uh, Captain Crowley's Mandolin. I've never read that book. I would actually don't know even if I was a book, but that's a movie as well, right? I think I've seen the movie. Cool. I'm going to go ahead and move on if that's all right. If anyone wants to continue to uh, share in the chat, I'll keep an eye on that, but I think it's time to, the book is better. Cool. I didn't know that. Um, I'll be sure to take a look at that. Uh, but let's go ahead and move on to another one of my favorite topics, graphic novels. Woo! 
Uh, before I get started on the fun stuff, there's a hot topic in the world of graphic novels, more specifically in the world of graphic novels for teens and kids, but that I feel it'd be remiss of me not to at least mention. Has anybody heard what's going on right now with the book Mouse? Unfortunately, I can't, you know, see you guys to know whether you're shaking your heads or nodding, but I'll assume that at least some of you haven't. So let me talk about it. The school board for McMinn County in Tennessee elected to remove the graphic novel Mouse from classrooms. Mouse is a Pulitzer Prize winning book known for its unflinching depiction of the Holocaust through the eyes of, um, excuse me, through the eyes of writer and illustrator Art Spiegelman's father, a Holocaust survivor. Although this particular case has drawn a great deal of attention, it's only one in a series of efforts to ban or otherwise limit access to graphic novels, especially those that come from minoritized creators. Another example is Genderqueer, written and illustrated by, and I'm not quite sure how to pronounce this name, Maya Kobabe would be my guess, a graphic novel that is currently one of the most banned books in the country. I'm not here to talk about censorship in the context of literature for children and teens, but I did wanna point out that there seems to be something of a double standard when it comes to graphic novels. A lot of the content being pointed to as objectionable in these titles, especially related to sexuality, language, and violence, is comparable to or even milder than the content of prose works that have, at least so far, you know, fingers crossed, gone unchallenged. I have my own thoughts about why this might be, but before I share them, I was wondering if any of you had any guesses to why graphic novels in particular have been the subject of so many challenges recently. So if anyone wants to drop those guesses in the chat, I would love to see those. I'll give you a second to type because I know it can take a little while to, to do that. Does anybody have any thoughts as to why graphic novels have been the subject of a lot of book challenges recently? No idea. <laughs> Marilyn says it's because kids read them too. And Laurel says, that's an interesting question. I agree, it is an interesting question. I kind of want to zoom in actually on something that Marilyn said. I think that one significant reason, and certainly the reason that's most relevant to today's talk is that people assume that all graphic novels are intended for young readers. When in fact, just as with prose works, they can be extremely specific in terms of audience. I'm seeing some other, um, some additional comments in the chat. Um, April says it's no longer up to an individual's imagination to see what a scene might look like. I think that's really true. I think that there's a visual impact in graphic novels that's not there in you know, prose works. Um, yeah, there's also a conversation about violence in video games and movies. So, you know, it's certainly the content that is being objected to in these works isn't specific to graphic novels. Um, if you'll direct your attention to the uh, screenshot that I have uh, placed here on the screen, it's from the Goodreads page for the graphic novel, Seek You, A Journey Through American Loneliness, written and illustrated by Kristen Radke. I've got it right here, just so you can see what it looks like. Um, the dust jacket description of Seek You describes it as a wide ranging exploration of our inner lives that digs into our attempts to feel closer to one another and the distance that remains through the lenses of gender and violence and technology and art. So you read that description, you see this cover, nothing about this kind of whole package to me screams, I should give this book to children. And yet there are definitely people out there who look at the title, see that it's a graphic novel and guess that it might be family friendly. I recognize I'm bragging a little bit on the person asking this question, HN. I don't know who they are. I don't know why they felt like they um, wanted to ask this, um, but it's certainly reflective of an attitude that I've encountered in other contexts. Now, here's a question for you all. What do the images on this screen all have in common? Any guesses? Anybody have any ideas what these all have in common? Exactly, April got it on the nose. They are all works based on graphic novels. Um, uh, if there's one thing I hope that you all take away from today's talk, it's that graphic novels represent as wide a range of genres, tones, and target audience as prose works. 
And just because a book is a graphic novel, it doesn't mean that it's intended for or will speak to only one particular audience. Now, I've been saying graphic novel quite a bit. You might be wondering what I mean when I use this term. So let's talk about that. You could ask a hundred different people and get a hundred different answers to the question, what is a graphic novel? I'm gonna share how I typically use this term and how I'll be using it for the remainder of the talk. But you may wanna bear in mind that there are people who would literally recoil in horror at the definition I'm about to provide. It's a surprisingly controversial topic. At the most basic level, a graphic novel is any book that is primarily or completely composed of what we call sequential art. Sequential art is a term that was coined by artist Will Eisner and is defined as a series of images that when read in a particular order, tell a story. In sequential art, the changes between each subsequent image usually convey either motion or the passage of time, which stands in contrast to, for example, the illustrations you'd find in a picture book, each of which typically depicts a single stationary image. A graphic novel can either tell a standalone story or it can exist as part of a series. It can be a wholly original work, or it can be a collection of content that was previously published, either online as a webcomic or in single comic book issues, what we call floppies. I've got a floppy here to show you what I mean. I think people sometimes call this a comic book. I'm calling it a floppy just for the sake of this. If you get a bunch of them, collect them together, you can have a graphic novel. Although, as I mentioned, you could easily find folks who disagree with me, as far as I'm concerned, as long as there's a book that has pictures which tell a story when read in a particular order, you have yourself a graphic novel. Before we move on, does anybody have any questions at this point, maybe about what constitutes a graphic novel, anything else I've kind of mentioned so far? Giving folks a check in, second to <laughs> type their questions in the chat if they have any. Okay, we've got a question from April. I'm curious about comics anthologies. Um, uh, like the Calvin and Hobbes books. That's a, that is an interesting question. <laughs> um, like I said, I, I feel like I take a very sort of broad and perhaps controversial stance on what constitutes a graphic novel. Uh, for me, I sort of uh, use the presence of sequential art as the defining factor. If we're talking about, for example, where something would be shelved in a library, uh, the Calvin and Hobbes books probably would not be shelved in the graphic novel section just because they, you know, uh, the, the origin of that material, I think people think of like newspaper comics as being sort of separate and I can see why. Um, but I don't personally feel the need to differentiate them when I'm just talking about them casually. And I think that, Again, with newspaper comics, as with kind of other forms of comics that we're talking about, there's a wide range of audiences and genres represented. So for me, it all makes sense to discuss it as one kind of cohesive whole, but I could definitely see the argument that they need to be <laughs> siphoned off in some way. I feel like that was a little rambly. I hope it, I hope it all made sense. Does anybody else have any uh, questions at this point? Marilyn asks, could you clarify what is the difference between a comic and a graphic novel? Um, absolutely. To my mind, the main difference between a comic and a graphic novel is sort of format. A graphic novel can't exist as, for example, a webcomic because that's online. But if you collected that webcomic in print form, you know, bound it together, I would consider that a graphic novel. Likewise, a comic could be a single floppy issue. That by itself is not a graphic novel, but if you took the content of these, bound them all together in one book, I would personally consider that a graphic novel. So it's more about format, it's not about content. Does that make sense? Cool. All right, like I said, we'll have more time for questions at the end. So if any of you are still stewing formulating, please, uh, please let me know at that point. Uh, now, if you're here, I'm assuming you're at least somewhat interested in reading graphic novels, but I'm hoping that by outlining some of the reasons that I personally read them, I can either motivate you to move some titles from your to be read pile to your actively reading list, 
or I can help you overcome any hesitation you've experienced that's prevented you from picking up a graphic novel up to this point. Arguments for the importance or validity of graphic novels often revolve around how they can encourage young folks who are reluctant readers to pick up more books. That's great for reluctant readers, <laughs> but it certainly isn't top of mind for me when I pick up a graphic novel to read and enjoy. When reflecting on why I read graphic novels, I came up with three main reasons that I'll be sharing with you all today. The first is that graphic novels promote visual literacy. The second is that they showcase creators from diverse backgrounds. And the third is a secret surprise that I will get to in just a second. So let's dive into each of these a little bit more. First, visual literacy. I'm sure that most of you are familiar with the concept of literacy, but did you know there's actually many different types of literacy? It's not just about the ability to read written words on a page. The ACRL defines visual literacy as a set of abilities that enables an individual to effectively find, interpret, evaluate, use, and create images and visual media. What that means in essence is that a visually literate person is someone who can look at an image and gather information from it and to effectively convey information to others using images. Thinking about the sheer number of images that the average person encounters in a given day, I'm sure you can imagine why it's important to be able to make sense of those images and the information they contain. So what does this all have to do with graphic novels? I'm sure you're wondering. <laughs> By presenting text alongside illustrations, graphic novels provide multiple channels through which information can be conveyed to the reader. This can include design choices such as the layout of the page or use of color, in addition to the contents of the images on the page and the written text itself. What's really cool about this is that creators can either reinforce a single message by making sure that all of these channels of information work in tandem or they can use these channels to prevent conflicting information in a way that trains the reader to question what they see and to not take everything at face value. Let's look at some examples of each. One example of a title that makes great use of multiple channels of information is a personal favorite title of mine, The Art of Charlie Chan Hock Chai, written and illustrated by Sunny Liu. Presented as the biography of a fictional cartoonist, this title tells the story of Singapore by showing how various seismic events in the country's history impact the style and subject matter of Charlie's work. The changing illustration style throughout the course of the book underscores how one's worldview can change in light of events both big and small. As Charlie's awareness of the complicated and messy world around him grows, his art becomes more detailed and the stories he tells become darker in tone. We are explicitly told how Charlie feels about the events that transpire, but we can also see echoes of those feelings in his art. Leah uses artistic decisions to reinforce the message of the text and the images, but that doesn't always have to be the case. Sometimes an artist can intentionally create a disconnect between story and art in order to create a more layered reading experience. An example of this can be seen in Stone Fruit, written and illustrated by Lee Lai. This title chronicles the dissolution and aftermath of a relationship between two women. Despite the fact that the story has no supernatural elements to speak of, the characters are occasionally depicted as taking on these bizarre monstrous forms that you see here, which are a reflection of how they see themselves or perhaps one another in that particular moment. The characters aren't literally monsters, but we're able to see that they somehow feel wild or inhuman throughout the course of the story. By intentionally creating disparity between what we're seeing on the page and what we know to be true about the characters, Lai challenges the reader to critically engage with ideas of point of view, objectivity, and the ways in which our emotions impact how we interact with other people. Now, I think that part of the reason people read is to learn about experiences other than our own, and graphic novels often shine a light on experiences and identities that aren't sufficiently explored in other media. Minoritized creators often face barriers to entry when it comes to traditional mainstream publishing. Because fans of graphic novels tend to be especially passionate about what they read, by cultivating an audience among these readers, creators can achieve greater success and recognition than what might otherwise be possible. Uh, some cool examples of this you can see on the screen, the Beyond Anthology series and the Elements Anthology series. 
Uh, Beyond is an anthology series which showcases work by queer creators, and Elements is an anthology series which highlights creators of color. Both of these anthology series came about as a result of crowdfunding efforts, meaning that these stories would literally not exist and be out there in the world for us to enjoy were it not for the dedication of graphic novel readers. I think that's pretty cool. Creators can also build an audience for their work online, either through web comics or through art posted to social media, which can in turn lead to mainstream publishers taking note of creators and works that they might otherwise overlook. A great example of this is Aminder Dalawal, a woman of color whose work often features LGBTQIA plus themes and characters. Dalawal began posting comics to her Instagram and eventually developed such a following online that she drew the attention of a major print publisher which led to her comics being collected in print. One of these collections is Cyclopedia Exotica, a humorous and irreverent examination of a world in which humans live alongside a race of, a race of one-eyed cyclopses. Cyclopedia Exotica is an extremely strange but ultimately delightful book. And it's hard to imagine achieving the level of recognition that it did if Dalawal didn't bring a considerable audience with her already. So, I teased earlier that I had three reasons why all of us should be reading graphic novels. Does anybody want to guess what the third reason might be? <laughs> Laurel got it in one. It's because they're super cool. <laughs> Whatever your interest in terms of genre, setting, character, or tone, I believe there is a graphic novel out there that is just right for you from horror to romance to humor and sci-fi, there's an amazing array of stories being told in the graphic novel format. Some of the most compelling characters and memorable moments from media that I've consumed in recent years have been found in graphic novels. I'm always excited when I get to share the joy that I get from reading these stories with other people like all of you. <laughs> so, now that you've been won over by my incredible skills of persuasion, I'm sure you're wondering, what graphic novels would I recommend? I'm going to begin by going over some titles that are good places to start if you're new to the world of graphic novels. Then I'm going to be highlighting a few recent titles that really stood out to me. Just because I'm curious, as I'm going through each of these, there is something I would like all of you to do. If a title comes up on screen that you've already read, I would love it if you could type read that into the chat. Likewise, if a title sounds interesting to you, but you haven't had the chance to read it yet, I would love it if you could type want to read into the chat. This will help me to get a better sense of the level of experience with graphic novels that you all are bringing to the table and where the focus of your collective interest may lie. So that's read that for books that you've read and want to read for books that look interesting. Does that all sound good? I I have to assume that you all are uh, nodding your heads vigorously because again, I can't see you. <laughs> no discussion of adult graphic novels would be complete without mentioning Alison Bechtel. A luminary of the comics industry, Bechtel creates works that strike the perfect balance between searingly intimate and universally relatable. Heartbreakingly sad, yet gut-bustingly hilarious. Fun Home in particular, Beck does reflections on coming of age and her complicated relationship with her father is a great place for newbies to start. Pick this one up if you're a fan of literary fiction, if you're in need of a good laugh, or if you're in need of a good cry. So I'm seeing some people have said in the chat that they've read that. Has anybody who's not read it think it looks interesting? Maybe they want to pick it up? Whoops. <laughs> Preview of the next slide. <laughs> I've got a want to read from Marilyn. Awesome. All right, I'm going to move on to the next title. Another great point of entry is Saga, a series of graphic novels written by Brian K. Vaughn and illustrated by Fiona Staples. <laughs> Set in a fantastical universe where magic is real and television-headed aristocrats clash with goat-horned aliens, Saga manages to marry both sci-fi and fantasy with dynamic interpersonal drama and epic interplanetary stakes. Plus, there's a green cat that knows when people are lying. Um, what's not to love about that? Do be forewarned, Saga is pretty explicit in terms of violence and sexuality and definitely isn't for the faint of heart. Um, I think I saw a raised hand a second ago. Did, did, was that intentional? Did someone? 
maybe not. Um, I'm seeing some wanna reads. Cool. I would strongly recommend this one. I would recommend everything um, that, that I'm including here, but this is an especially good one. And Marilyn's saying violence, maybe not so much. Definitely get that. Not every title is going to be for everybody. Um, bad news for those of you who um, aren't big fans of violence, unfortunately. Um, uh, this next one, definitely not going to be for everybody. But if you want to see some gorgeous artwork and don't mind a fair amount of gore, I would strongly recommend Monstrous by Marjorie Liu and Sana Takeda. This horror fantasy series depicts a world inspired by Asian mythology using some of the most lush and evocative illustrations that I have ever seen. Rush out and grab this one if you need a little more beauty, ferocity, and excitement in your life. April saying that this is a wanna read. I, 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 you know, again, not for everybody, but if this looks good, definitely check it out because the visuals are incredible. On a significantly lighter note, we have Hark, A Vagrant, the hilarious and irreverent title from Kate Beaton. Using simple black and white illustrations, Beaton skewers culture in a way that appeals to the reader's highest and lowest sensibilities simultaneously. And you may even learn something along the way. If you're a history buff, a fan of classic literature, or just in the mood to read some of the stupidest jokes you've ever seen, this one is definitely for you. We've got Sally and Laurel both in the chat saying they want to read it. This one is super fun and very lighthearted. So if maybe the more intense works aren't up your alley, this one might be a better option for sure. Marilyn saying want to read. Cool. With visuals that evoke a B movie from the 1950s, Black Hole, written and illustrated by Charles Burns, is a coming of age fable about just how strange and scary growing up can be. A mysterious disease emerges among the teenage population of a town, causing them to develop bizarre physical mutations. Perfect for avid moviegoers or for anyone who remembers what it was like to take those first uneasy steps into adulthood. Once you witness Black Hole's striking imagery and captivating storyline, I promise you will never forget them. Is this jumping out to anybody? Anybody, any, anyone who reads on this one? Kathleen saying wanna read, awesome. When you've been cooped up inside for too long, a feeling I'm guessing that one or two of you may be able to relate to, nothing hits the spot quite like a book that's able to whisk you away to another time and place. French Milk, written and illustrated by Lucy Nisley, is a truly transportative tale which brings the reader along with the author as she spends six weeks in Paris as a young woman. Nisley has written a whole slew of graphic memoirs on topics from food, to motherhood. Put this one on the top of your to-be-read pile if you miss what it feels like to explore a new place and learn more about yourself in the process. Yeah, I'm seeing a couple people saying this one looks interesting, they wanna check it out. This is a really good one. Um, if this doesn't sound exactly up your alley, there's a bunch of, uh, <laughs> yeah, a bunch of great works by Lucy Nisley, as April's pointing out, all of her work is super great. Um, I'd, I'd recommend basically anything by Lucy Nisley. Lesser known, but no less impactful than the aforementioned titles, Three Story, The Secret History of the Giant Man, written and illustrated by Matt Kint, is a profound and melancholy meditation on distance, growth, and growing apart. Kint uses a scrapbook format, interspersing photos and newspaper clippings, in quotes, obviously they're all illustrations, <laughs> to imagine the story of a gigantic man and the impacts of his life on three women, his mother, his wife, and his daughter. If family sagas speak to you, or if you're interested in seeing some really interesting experimentation with the graphic novel form, this one is a must read. April saying wanna read. Has anybody read this one? Yeah, Laurel saying sounds interesting. Like I mentioned, it's it's a lesser known title, so I would be maybe surprised if people had found it, but I love to, you know, kind of point people in the direction of these kind of lesser known gems. That's always fun for me. Marilyn saying interesting. Uh, last among the good starting point titles, I wanted to recommend a title that like Alison Bechdel's Fun Home reflects on coming of age, but against a very different backdrop. Persepolis, written and illustrated by Marjane Satrapi, recounts the author's childhood in Iran with equal parts humor and heart. 
People curious about the Iranian revolution will want to pick this one up, as will anyone who can relate to the growing pains that result when who you are doesn't perfectly align with what society or your family expects you to be. Incidentally, this title was also adapted into an animated film um, that uses the same visual style as the graphic novel. I would strongly recommend people check out both. Um, a couple of people, seems like they've read it. I'm seeing Kim, Karen, uh, April have all read it. Sally is saying, wow, it looks good. <laughs> it is good. <laughs> so, like I said, those were some of the, what I think are the best starting points if you're new to the world of graphic novels. Um, before I jump into the recent releases, is everybody feeling good? Um, I'm gonna take a quick drink of water if anyone wants to drop any thoughts in the chat before I move on. Yeah, um, April and Laurel are talking in the chat about you know how much they learned about the Iranian revolution. Uh, from, from this book and maybe it's, you know, in some ways it's, it's, it's you know, a, a great way to learn about that <laughs> in some ways, in, in every way, it's a great way to learn about that. <laughs> so like I mentioned, uh, now that I've shared what I think are some of the best starting places, if you're new to the world of graphic novels, I wanted to highlight some recent releases that I'd recommend regardless of your experience with the format. So whether you're a total newbie, whether you've read everything that I already talked about, these are some titles that I think people should check out. First, I wanted to draw attention to Shadow Life, written by Hiromi Goto and illustrated by Anne Zhu. An entrancing meditation on growing older and the inevitability of death, Shadow Life tells the story of Kumiko, an elderly Japanese Canadian woman, woman who has to deal with the overbearing ministrations of her adult daughters, as well as the sneaking suspicion that something sinister and supernatural is lurking just around the corner. Grace and Frankie meets Buffy the Vampire Slayer, excuse me, this title goes in some truly unexpected directions and is a fascinating read from start to finish. <laughs> did, 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 that, did that jump out? Grace and Frankie meets by the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> Has anybody read this one? Just out of curiosity. It's a relatively recent release as are all the titles I'm about to share. Karen's interested? Cool. Junji Ito is the undisputed master of horror comics in Japan. And his latest graphic novel, Ramina, shows exactly why. When a mysterious planet emerges and appears to be on a collision course with the Earth, it doesn't take long for the panicked populace to turn on one another. Cosmic horror in the truest sense, Ramina is another title that probably isn't for you if you don't have the stomach for gore. But if you're in a cataclysmic sort of mood, as I have found myself in a lot <laughs> recently, this story has more than enough shocking twists and turns to satisfy. Based on everyone's uh, previous reactions to previous titles, I'm guessing this is maybe not gonna be up everyone's alley, especially not in this group, but you know, maybe worth giving a shot. Kim saying, wanna read? Cool. I already mentioned Alison Bechdel's most well-known work, Fun Home, but what can I say? I'm a huge fan of Bechdel's latest work as well. The Secret to Superhuman Strength is a combination memoir and history exploring both Bechdel's own fitness journey and the role that fitness has played historically in Western civilization. Especially now in a moment when health, wellness and self-care is on everybody's mind, The Secret to Superhuman Strength is a resonant and impactful text that runs the gamut as so many of Bechdel's books do from serious and sobering to goofy and joyous. An exceptional pick, whatever your interests or background. Seeming that people are interested in this one, it's on April's TBR pile. Um, looks like Deborah's currently reading it. Awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah, a lot of, lot of one reads in this one. This is a strong recommend for me. I really enjoyed it. When brothers Rowan and Tulip open up a farm to table restaurant in London, neither suspects that death and deception are gonna be on the menu. The Delicacy, written and illustrated by James Albon, is an engaging exploration of ambition, loyalty, and fine dining, equally ideal for watchers of Top Chef or fans of Criminal Minds. Check this one out if you've got an appetite for suspense. Did you guys see what I did there? Appetite for suspense, because it's about food. 
I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I owe you all an apology. Uh, but Karen's saying interesting. Great. <laughs> if you're looking for a fun, frothy, and body positive adventure, look no further than Thirsty Mermaids by Cat Lay. A trio of mermaids come ashore and find themselves trapped in human form, and their ensuing antics are a source of almost endless delight. Perfect for fans of inclusive, exuberant fantasy, pick this title up if you're in need of a reminder of how wild and wonderful the human world can be. And although I didn't uh, write this out, when I was sourcing this image, someone looked over my shoulder and said, that looks like bridesmaids under the sea. And that's actually a really good description. So if you're interested in bridesmaids under the sea, I would strongly <laughs> recommend you pick this one up because that's basically what it is. It's, it's fun, a little sad, but mostly fun. And there's mermaids. <laughs> Laurel saying, count me in, fun and frothy. I agree, that's, it's perfect. <laughs> Looking at the cover of this title might suggest that it's only for horror lovers, but Maniac of New York, written by Elliot Kalin and with art by Andrea Muti, contains surprising depths. In a version of New York where a supernatural slasher is just another fact of life, the uh, Daily News gives a maniac forecast alongside traffic and weather, the real peril proves to be a bureaucratic system better at placing the blame than grappling with difficult realities. Tense, engaging, and humanist, Maniac of New York is a must read for fans of action with a socially conscious twist. I'm seeing a nah from Sally on this one. Yeah, again, based on the interest that you all have shown so far, it's seeming like maybe the, the gorier, the horrier, hor horror, Whoa, that's hard to say. <laughs> Gore and horror is maybe not up everyone's alley, but Kim's saying looks good. Yeah, this one really surprised me. I was not expecting what it would be when I went in. Yeah, Marilyn's saying too much like reality. I get that, you know, part of the reason I think some people read is to escape, get away from real life and stuff that reminds you of real life is not always what you want, you know, in that moment. So I definitely get that. So this is the last kind of recent release that I pulled out and I wanted to share with you all. Um, it's called Wake. It was written by Rebecca Hall and illustrated by Hugo Martinez. Wake tells the story of several slave uprisings led by women, events that have been largely erased from the historical record. Hall and Martinez give faces and forms to these forgotten female freedom fighters. And in doing so, take a stand against the structures of power that would seek to diminish dehumanize and devaluate this one up, De devaluate them, excuse me. Pick this one up for a necessary reminder that throughout history, extraordinary individuals have stood up to unjust systems, even in the face of immense hardship. Yeah, we've got a couple of people in the chat saying that they're interested, looks good. Sally, Karen, Kathleen, April. Yeah, this is a strong recommend for me. I wanted to kind of finish out strong. This is one I would recommend everybody pick up. So, I could go on, <laughs> there's a lot more titles I'd be happy to talk about, but I think now's a good time to, yeah, Marilyn, uh, that's an excellent choice for Black History Month. Uh, I think now's a good time to uh, stop with the recommendations and say, thank you all so much for listening. Um, if even a little bit of my enthusiasm for graphic novels has rubbed off on any of you, I feel like I have done my job today. <laughs> I've listed my uh, email and phone number on the slide here. If any of you would like to follow up with me later, if you have any questions, if you wanna just talk about graphic novels, I'm always happy to do so. <laughs> um, and if anybody has any questions for me now, I would be happy to uh, try and answer those. That was great, Lee, thank you. And I just wanna reiterate that I will be making a biblio list that's connected when possible to our catalog and sending that out to everyone who attended. Um, so I will follow up with that so you don't have to write frantically as I was starting to do and then realize, <laughs> wait a second, I'm, no, there's too many. Yeah, and if you are um, a, a DPL card holder, all of these should be available to you, so. <laughs> wonderful, good. Does anybody have any questions, anything they want me to talk about further, any thoughts they want to share? I did have one additional thing um, that um, I would like to uh, just 
share as an additional resource in case you're curious. Uh, on the slide where I talked about the recent spate of book challenges, um, this is a world that I've very much been living in, but I recognize that not everyone maybe has all of the context for that. So I'm gonna drop a link in the chat to an article from School Library Journal that kind of summarizes those issues. Just in case you wanna learn more about that, I think it's a really good starting point and does a good job of presenting different sides of the issue. Um, so I'm gonna drop that link in the chat right now. Um, I saw a comment from uh, Marilyn saying, I love all the different artwork, different styles, et cetera. Yeah, I, I, I really love when a book has a, a really specific visual point of view. For me, that's really exciting. Um, again, it kind of just speaks to the, uh, the incredible breadth of the world of graphic novels. Um, it's uh, a great medium for self-expression. And Kathleen, um, I'll be sending out this recording when in a soon uh, out to everyone that signed up for this uh, meeting. So I'll send you a link to that. And yes, Sally, I will add that link to the email I send out with the biblio list as well. There's a lot of resources coming your way. <laughs> That's good. That's good. I'm my to be read pile mental list just got a lot bigger. So <laughs> Graphic novels are fun though because I always feel like a sense of accomplishment. Like, yeah, I read a book in one day, but it's a graphic novel. <laughs> oh, you know, but yeah. but they're they're also I find that they stick with me more. Like, I remember more. I was in a. I remember more about like Persepolis and the Iranian Revolution than I do of any history class I ever took. And if there's something about that that physical medium um, that visual medium. And April has a comment. I appreciate your initial comment about moving away from, oh, these are books for reluctant readers. Yeah, I, like I said, I, I think that's super, it's super valuable to, to, to remember that, to have that conversation, but I don't love that conversations around graphic novels are always centered around like children and what children are reading. I, you know, I think that that de-emphasizes the role that they can play in, in, in your book diet, whatever your age, so. <laughs> yeah, people who say, I want my kids to read real books. Graphic novels are real books. I, I, I firmly believe they are. <laughs> Marilyn's asking, I heard the University of Oregon has some kind of minor degree in comics or something. Do you know of it? I don't actually. That's a great, great question. Um. I actually do only because uh, I had a presenter give a talk about um, graphic novel journalism, um, which I can also send a link out to that as well because it was recorded. And she was, uh, I think, the co director of, her name is Catherine Kelp Stevens, and she's part of the um, uh, U of O's comic book degree that they have. So they have a comics degree um, at U of O. So I will make sure to send that out as well because yeah, that was fascinating. And Kim says, uh, thanks for the suggestions. I'm looking forward to checking out Saga and Mantras especially. Cool. Well, I'm going to get all of those resources out to everyone. I appreciate Lee. I, this was a great overview of a topic that's surprisingly complicated and covers so many different genres. Um, so thank you for sharing some of your knowledge with us. And thank you for everyone for participating and answering and uh, helping us to know more about what you're interested in. So hope you all have a wonderful rest of your afternoon and go to the library and get some more books. So <laughs> thanks, Lee. Thank you. Bye.